we are returning to our subject, which this series has grown strongly to, and we are in sermon number 107. We're dealing with the aspect of God's command on his law, how we should understand it in covenantal context, and that it is the standard by which we are to govern our life in our progression of sanctification toward that high calling of God unto that state of perfection. Though we will never reach it in this life, nevertheless, we strive toward that life that we have been called to live in Christ. We are still in this, the Eighth Commandment. And we have taken up this whole issue of what sins are forbidden in the Eighth Commandment. Now, we've looked at some aspects of that, but now we're looking in particular at just these things that address the issues that are very important for us concerning things that we need to avoid in our Christian world walk. If you will, our text throughout this series has been Deuteronomy 9, 10 through 11. And if you will, let us read from the inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of the living God. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone the tablets of the covenant. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our Holy Father, we're thankful for the privilege that we have to come to once again consider the very nature of thy word, what it means to us. We pray, O oh God, that as you have seen fit to call us into your kingdom, you have given us thy spirit who will teach us all things from thy word. Let us never forget from which we are to be committed. It is to thy word. It is to Christ who is the head of our church. It is to follow and to yield to the spirit who has written that word for us that we may know what is expected of us in our Christian walk. Thus we ask, O oh Father, you will bless us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive that which your word and spirit would teach us in this hour. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now the question that we've been looking at, which is, which is the Eighth Commandment? And the Eighth Commandment we said is, Thou shalt not steal, taken out of, Exodus 2015. We've talked about that general scope. I don't want to go into great detail here. But that scope of the respect that is required toward the right of ownership of private property and things. For it is only in light of the right to own these things can the law be stated in the negative. Thou shall not steal. Property, we said, is wealth, and we have been entrusted as a steward to maintain our wealth and property as God sees fit to give it to us, not only for our existence, but to advance the work of his kingdom. So it is we have a great duty and responsibility. 
And to this we will say God has spoken this to every area of life. Every area of life is affected by the word of God. It talks about well, it talks then about economics. It talks about social structuring of societies. And so it has a sociocultural perspective to it. It speaks about so many things to us. Education and these other areas of our departments of our studies about the world in which we live. It doesn't speak exhaustively upon each subject, but it does speak authoritatively on each subject. Thus, the Eighth Commandment requires us that we must be vigilant, constantly seeking to gather wealth, to respect that which is owned by another, not to remove it unlawfully from him or take it in any form from him, but we are to protect his right, our right, to that wealth, because this is the command of the moral law of God. While the command is in the negative, it is in the positive that we have looked at this law thus far. But we began looking at what sins are forbidden concerning this law. And that's in our question number 142 of the larger catechism. And the sins that were forbidden in the Eighth Commandment, besides the neglect of the duties that are required of us, we do not have a right to neglect those duties. We do not have the right not to gather wealth and preserve property. But at the same time, there are things that the divines felt we needed of necessity to understand in order that we would properly be able to set forth our responsibilities in this life in order that we would not sin against the will of God. And the will is known by his law. And so it is, we've been looking at those various areas that the divines cite in particular. And I want to pick up where we left off the last time we were in this series and speaking. And the next thing that the divines were talking about is this. We are to be careful that we do not sin by injustice and unfaithfulness in contracts between man and man. Now, our confession is very clear. If you pledge something, if you vow something, if you agree to something, you better be sure that you want to do that very thing. You want to commit yourself to what you have done. For God does not take it lightly. Once you have committed, there is no turning back. As a matter of fact, our divine said, and they have footnoted it from Scripture, that even if once you enter into that relationship and realize that is, that is exactly that you're not going down the path you want to go, you're committed. And you must see it through, even if it is to your own hurt. You've been warned. You've been told. Do not enter lightly into these agreements. And in particular, we talk about this in light of contracts dealing with man to man, let alone making some kind of commitment or vow or promise to God of something we would do in our life dealing with those issues that deal within the first four commandments of, of loving God, of committing ourselves 
to his ministry, to his word, to the work of his kingdom. But here in this area of the latter six commandments, those that are given where we are told how men are to relate to men, the divines say injustice or unfaithfulness in contracts, agreements, if you will, in promises between man and man must not be violated. You don't want to keep a commitment, a contract? Then don't sign it. Don't agree to it. Don't promise. Don't pledge. We live in a day where most people think pledges are something or promises or vows that we take are just something that we can lightly take and consider it just something that we are doing at the time, but at will we may walk from it. That is not the case according to the law. We have a moral commitment to keep that which we vowed to keep. And it never surprises me how often people will vow, they will promise, they do everything that they can do to try to get you involved with their life. And when they are unhappy because they don't like the way it's going, they walk from it as if they never made a commitment at all. And they think somehow they are doing what is just. But the truth is, it's injustice. You want to be a member of a church? Take your vow. You want to be in trouble with God? Break it without a biblical doctrinal reason that would necessitate you to leave it. You want to agree to work and to be in union? and do the work and things of the Lord, and you contract with others to do the same thing, you pledge yourself to them to support each other, do the things that are necessary, do it. Do not think you can just walk from it. And I think this is where most Presbyterian churches today are really lax, and that's why we're dealing with so much sin in the Presbyterian churches. Men take vows, commit themselves to the word of God and to the work of Christ in his kingdom. But when somebody breaks that vow, the church does not rise up, whether it is the session or the Presbyterian assembly, and say, you made a commitment to us. You have no right to lightly consider that commitment and walk away from it. You have a duty to maintain it, to keep it, in every aspect of what you have committed yourself thereunto. So this injustice and unfaithfulness that is often found between man and man in Contractual relationships, however they are, whether they're written, verbal, does not matter. You need to pin down exactly what you're vowing yourself to. God tells us, consider the matter. You don't go into it blindly. Because once you go in, you're not coming out. And if you think you're going to come out, and you come out and you say, well, I'm still alive. God didn't take care of me. He didn't punish me for this. Wait. Wait. Give it time. Our God is patient and long-suffering, but payday comes one day. So what does this requirement mean to us? It means that we need to deal honestly with men. That's the bottom line. Honesty. Performance of what you have vowed to do. You have vowed to perform something. You've agreed to exchange something. Whatever the performance is required, do it. And do not walk from it. You must fulfill it in your life. Even 
if it's to your own. Well, if I keep that promise, if I keep that contract, if I keep that commitment, it will cost me dearly. Too bad. You made the commitment. And just because you are not judged immediately by God, do not think you have escaped from his presence if he doesn't know what you have done. And justice is actions that we would consider fraudulent. Where a man is unfaithful to his performance that he hath promised. We're told in Amos 8 and verse 5, saying, When will the new moon be past that we may sell grain and the Sabbath, that we may trade wheat, making the ephah, that is, a one and one-tenth bushel of wheat, or corn, small, and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit. In Psalm 37, 21, you have some of the same principle. The wicked borrows and does not repay. You borrow money, repay it according to your agreement. People think, when I borrow, I have no responsibilities. Actually, you do. I always tell Christians, if you don't want to let people borrow something, buy it and give it to them so that you don't have to deal with the fact that they're not going to return. For sometimes Christians are worse than non-Christians in these areas. Well, he goes on here in the psalm and says, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. He gives. He's willing to show mercy. Galatians in 3, verse 15, the apostle Paul writes, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, that is a man's contract, yet if it is confirmed, that is if it is agreed to, no one annuls or adds to it. You can't de delete any aspect of that contractual relationship, of that covenant between two men, nor can you add things that were not originally agreed to when you signed it. You must fulfill what is exact in the agreement. And so it's very important. Always consider your actions when it comes to making vows and promises, contracts, agreements to enter into with other men. Are you counting the cost? That's the question. Are you really considering what this means? Are you willing to commit to that no matter what comes. That becomes the greatest question I think you can have. But they went on to say, or in matters of trust. That is to say, there is a trust that is built upon fulfillment of these agreements. Luke 16, 10 through 12 says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. I know people that want a lot. They really would like and demand a lot of things in their life. Give me the bigger things. Well, the answer is, can you be faithful with a little first? Because faithlessness in the little that is not doing and performing what you have been given, even though it is only a small portion, nevertheless, is a direct sign you cannot be faithful 
in larger things. So he says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Why would anybody commit any kind of trust to you? Because you've been and proven yourself to be untrustworthy. Oh, you're measured. You're measured by what you promise to do, perform, to what you have committed. And thus, when it comes to matters of trust, it's a very important thing in your life. Well, he goes on in verse 12 and says, And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your Oh, so along with that contract, that commitment, that promise, that requirement of performance, if you do not perform, if you borrow and don't pay back, whatever it is you do, Just remember, when it comes to trust in larger things, he who has been unfaithful in smaller things will never be trusted with the larger. You will isolate yourself. You will be known as someone who cannot be trusted. No, if you loan him $100, he'll be unfaithful. So don't think about the fact you're going to give him $10,000. He may be grateful you gave it, but he's not going to be willing to pay it back. You cannot trust him. Trust is built on keeping and fulfilling your promises, your commitments. And that's how one knows the heart of the individual. It is measured by his actions to fulfill, to perform all that is promised. Well, another thing that the Westminster Divine set forth in the larger catechism was oppression. An interesting term. We hear that term used a lot today. We're oppressed. Well, oppression is real. Just depends, I think, on the context and it's usage of how one is to express it. The term is translated in a variety of Hebrew words, all of which, however, agree in the very general sense of wrong done by violence to others. That's what oppression is. Wrongs that are done through violence to others. A people who is oppressed have been dealt with wrongly through violence to force them into a certain condition. There are a few cases where the references to the oppression of Israel by foreigners, as by their Egyptian taskmasters, or by Syria, or by an unmentioned nations that are also given in the scripture about how they came and oppressed the nation of Israel. But in the vast number of cases, the reference is to social oppression of one kind or another within Israel's own nation. Israel itself oppressed the people. Most likely, it is because of sin. And they have veered off of the way that a nation ought to go, and they are not following the law of God. It is frequently the theme of the psalmist and of the prophet 
and of the wise man. The poor and the weak must have suffered greatly at the hands of the stronger and the more fortunate. The word oppressed expresses their sorrow and indignation over the wrongs of their afflicted brethren. In his own sorrow, Job remembers the suffering of the oppressed. It is a frequent subject of song in the Psalms. And the preacher observes and reflects upon its prevalence. It was exercised toward strangers and also toward the Israelites themselves and was never wholly overcome within the nation. Oppression is when the law of God is violated by power, when it is by strength, of which is applied to force a person into a different status of life, whether it is one person or a group of people or a nation. It really does not matter. Violence is the way of oppression. Oppression is sinful and violation of this, the Eighth Commandment. We think back now. Think back to Karl Marx, who says nations are going to have to change. They're going to have to give up the way and the things they think of. These capitalist societies, these free market economies, even if it means through violence and revolution, that is oppression. And the reality is, in those types of society, they intend to oppress people by violence and revolution. They're not setting them free. They're only saying, if you're with us, we'll give you some freedom. If you're not, we will violate and oppress you. So keep that in mind. It is violence. It is revolution that causes oppression. Ezekiel 22, 29 says, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy. And they are wrongfully oppressed, and they wrongfully oppress the stranger. Leviticus 25, 17, Therefore you shall not oppress one another. You shall fear your Lord, for I am the Lord your Where there is true oppression, not just allegations of oppression, which really are not oppression at all. Having to follow the law of God is not an oppression. Fulfilling your vows in church membership and being under discipline when you violate them, that's not oppression. Oppression is when you are violated by violence to live or to do something that does not keep the law of God. And so it is, there is oppression. And there is justified, an argument, if you will, I mean, justifying the fact that someone is oppressed. But oppression is the way and the gateway word for communism, for socialism. We are an oppressed people. Why? Because we want somebody else to work. We want them to give us what they have earned. We want everything in life. We do not want to follow the laws. We want to live as we want to live. That's not oppression. That's rebellion. That's the very nature of socialism and communism. Till you have lived in real oppression. And if you want to find out what it is, go to Venezuela. Go 
to a communist. Go to China. Find out exactly what it means to live in oppression. We all hate injustice. And every injustice needs to be corrected. But those injustices, especially in that area of being oppressed, must be acts of violence which force you out of the commitment to the law of God and his word to worship our God, to live in the way that God has called us to. Live out our life daily. And so there is a biblical concept of oppression. No the difference. And then they say, extortion is wrong. Well, extortion indicates that one who is an extortioner is guilty of snatching away from another by strife, by greed, and oppression, that which does not lawfully belong to him. It is the snatching away from. It is the strife. It is the greed. It is the use of oppression. That is not lawfully being followed in the life that he is committed to live under the law of God. And thus, Extortion is unlawful. The element of covetousness and usury is involved in the meaning of this word. For it is greedily, that is, it is an intense, selfish desire for wealth and power by ill-gotten gain. Thus, we are to make sure that we do not fall into that sin of extortion. Matthew 23, 25 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. And then in Ezekiel 22, 12, in you they take bribes to shed blood. You take usury and increase. You have made profit from your neighbors by extortion and have forgotten me, says the Lord our God. So it is this whole concept of extorting, of taking away unlawfully through oppression, through some other aspect of life. This is forbidden in and a violation of the Eighth Commandment. Thou shall not steal. Now, we mentioned usury, and I want to go on because that's something the divines also talk about. What is usury? Usury is the practice of making unethical or immoral monetary loans that unfairly enrich the lender. That term may be used in a moral sense, condemning, taking advantage of others' misfortunes. Or in a legal sense, where the interest rate is charged in excess of the maximum rate that is allowed by civil law. In modern days, we call this type of usury loan sharking. So let's say that Deacon Jason comes to me and he says, man, we're faulting on our loan. We can't, I'm not making enough money. I went to the bank to get a new loan to be able to, to make it so that it works and they won't lend me the money. Now, under his misfortune in God's divine providence, he should have listened when we told him don't buy the property. No, that's not 
what I'm arguing for here. I say to our brother, well, okay, how much you need? 100,000. Yeah, I can do that. But you're going to pay 30% interest on that. Well, the bank was only making me pay 4% interest. Yeah, but you couldn't get that loan. You want the loan, you got to pay the interest. You don't pay the interest, we break your legs. It's just a kind of a mob action is what we're talking about here. That's what loan sharking does. You need money. They know that in the providence of God, you're in a state of misfortune and you're almost willing to do anything, including making the mistake of taking their money with the understanding they're going to charge you an exorbitant amount of interest on that money. So I think we understand what usury is all about. As a matter of fact, among Christians, even in the Old Testament as well as the New, if you borrow money, you did not charge interest. You were forbidden to charge interest. By the way, in the history of the church, just so you know, the first council at Nicaea in 325 forbade clergy from engaging in usury. Now, normally, most of the clergy held a lot of money for the church. And when people needed money, they would come to the people who held the purse strings, and that was the clergy. And the clergy would try to extort money. They would try to attach a heavy usury, or if you will, a heavy interest rate. This is what the First Council of Nicaea said. For as much as many enrolled among the clergy, following covetousness and lust of gain, have forgotten the divine scripture which says, he has not given his money upon usury. Ezekiel 18 and verse 8. And in the lending money, ask the hundredth of the sum as a monthly interest. The holy and great synod thinks it just that if after this decree anyone be found to receive usury, whether he accomplish it by secret transaction or otherwise as by demanding the whole and one half or by using any other convenience or contrivance whatsoever for filthy lucre's sake, he shall be deposed from the clergy and his name stricken from the list. Canon 17. At the time, usury was interest of any kind. It did not make a difference. And the canon forbid the clergy to lend money of any kind of interest rate. They were not given to even allow 1% interest. Well, I'll loan you up this $1,000 with 1% interest. That's not much interest. But it was forbidden. Later, ecumenical councils applied this very same principle to the laity. At the Third Lateran Council, the church decreed that persons who accepted interest on loans could receive neither the sacraments nor Christian burial. And here's what they wrote. Nearly everyone, excuse me, I'm sorry, nearly everywhere, the crime of usury has become so firmly rooted that many, omitting other businesses, practice usury as if it were <clears throat> permitted. And in no way observe how it is forbidden in the, both the Old and the New Testaments. We therefore declare that notorious usurers should not be admitted to communion of the altar to receive Christian burial or to receive Christian burial if they die in this 
sin. Whoever receives them or gives them Christian burial should be compelled to give back what he has received and let him remain suspended from the performance of his office until he has made satisfaction according to the judgment of his own bishop. Canon number 25. So not only could the clergy not commit this sin of usury, neither could. Neither could the laity practice it either. That was not to say that a banking institution could not usually give a loan. Most of those institutions, once those things became formalized, as the structure of societies began to grow, they were limited by law. They had restrictions on how that they could loan and what they could get for certain things. And thus they were limited to do that. We're talking about that extreme interest rate that is charged to the individual, which puts him in even more of a dire misfortune in his life. And he won't be able to pay it back either. He's actually committed himself to something he won, lawfully could not commit. You can't take vows in violation of the law of God and the vow or the commitment be required. It's violated from its beginning. It's null and void. You cannot take a vow. You cannot pledge to do something sinful. That is impossible. Because we are vowed to commit ourselves to the keeping of God's law and the development of our sanctification in life. And so the church came down very hard. And it wasn't up to later generations that they began to wane away from these very things. Psalm 15 and verse 5 says, He who does not put out his money of you, Usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Don't use your money for usury. Don't receive a bribe against the innocent. That is to say, don't receive money to punish someone. But at the same time, if you are given a bribe, as it's saying it here, to do the right thing, if you don't receive it against the innocent, but you do the right thing and you do not violate them, then you're a person who shall never be moved. You're established in your faith. We'll look at bribery later on in this series. Because you can offer a person money to do the right thing rather than to sin or violate people, whether it's through violence or acts of violence or through theft or whatever the case may be, persecution or oppression. You can give somebody money and ask them, would you go away and take this money in exchange for not telling, not saying. It's like hiding the Jews during World War II in the various Christian homes in which when they came looking for them, they denied they had any knowledge or access to the Jews at all. Thinking in particular of that book written by Corey Ten Boom about her life in Germany. But in this verse here that we're talking about, I just read to you, David commands the godly neither to oppress their neighbors by usury nor to suffer them to be corrupted with bribes to favor unrighteous causes. That's what we're talking about. David, from our text, seems to condemn all kinds of usury in general. And without exception, the very name has been everywhere held in abhorrence. 
And so I say to you, it's very important to understand, we need to be not involved in usury. We need to live our life. If you want to loan money, you loan it without expectation of except getting it back. That's all. You have money and you have access of it because God has made you wealthy. And when someone has a need and you have the ability, I didn't say give when you don't have the ability, but when you have that ability, you can loan money without the, the expectation of getting interest. Now, I mean, if they want to give you more money, say, wow, we really appreciate what you did. Here's a couple extra hundred bucks just for what you did. Not, it's not you charging. That's them wanting to say thank you. Here's a gift from us, an act of love. That's okay. But you cannot say, okay, here's your $1,000. I expect $1,200 back, 200 of interest. That is usury. We are not to oppress the people, even in an economic need which is why we have to be very careful when we talk about taxation in our nation. Because taxation can also be another form of greediness that steals from the people. An excess. God says in Romans 13 that there is a just tax for government. But we also know there is an unjust tax by government. So we need to be careful. Usury, charging an interest, an exorbitant amount of money. Now, if you have a bank, banking is not illegal. You can invest money in your bank, and they will even give you money for investing with them. No, it's not much, believe me. But there's not... A danger in it today, for example. There's an insurance policy against a certain amount of money that if anything happens to it, they're going to make good for it. But they are governed by law that they can only loan you money at a certain interest rate. Whether we think that rate is right or whether it's wrong, whether it's too exorbitant or not, that is beside the point. They are in business for that very purpose of making a loan and collecting money for those who have invested their money in the bank in order to loan it out that they too can make money. That's legitimate. But it's not legitimate for me as a Christian or even as one who is in the clergy to loan you money that I do have, I'm capable of doing it, and then charging you an interest for it. That simply is forbidden. But then again, there's no requirement that you have to loan somebody money. Remember, you go back to the text of Scripture that says, a man needs to keep his commitments. He who is unfaithful in little cannot be trusted in much. Once he's proven unfaithful and little, you do not need to trust him. For he has broken his trust, his bond, his word. And therefore, you're not required to give to an individual in a loan. We have a requirement to give money to help the poor. As individuals, we do. But I'm talking about a person who wants to borrow money for a loan. Those who have proven to be unfaithful, untrue, non-trusting, we are not required to give them money. That is not our responsibility. But we have a great responsibility. And what I want you to see is we are literally dealing with economics at this point. How does a nation, its people, go forward and glorify God in the way that they work and at the way that they handle and help and bless each other in ways that God has blessed them so that they can be a benefit to others? That is the question. 
And so it is, economics begins to play a very important part. We need a biblical understanding of economics, of just weights and measures, as we talked about. We have real estate aspects of law. Don't remove the landmarks. Think of all the things we've been talking about. These are things that govern our life daily. It speaks to who we are as a people and to what we are doing to the glory of God. Are we keeping God's law? Are we following what he has commanded of us? That's the real question. I hope and I pray that we will learn to yield and heed to the call of the Spirit of God in keeping God's law in our life daily. And so it is, we will return next Lord's Day to pick up from here and go on and continue to look at what the Westminster Divines in the larger catechism said we were forbidden to practice in our lives and within our nation. Shall we pray?